Some years ago, GQ magazine interviewed Stephen Colbert just as he was about to take on the mantle of hosting The Late Show. He talked about his life and his career with witty humor and heartfelt authenticity. And buried in and among the anecdotes of his life and his takes on television and politics and many other issues was a simple but powerful theological statement. He said, you got to learn to love the Bible. He first explores this in terms of his early days doing stand-up comedy. And I see every comedian, even the best ones, bomb sometimes. Especially when they're getting started. There are always nights when the audience just isn't having it, the jokes aren't landing, the material is just not funny. Bombing is awkward and uncomfortable, probably because telling jokes to a room full of people who aren't laughing is the exact opposite of what a comedian wants to be doing. It's utter failure. Comedy, he says, helped him learn what it means to love the bomb. In comedy, everybody bombs. Learning to love the bomb helps you keep going. And better yet, to even enjoy what might be otherwise unenjoyable. Colbert says, it took me a long time to really understand what that meant. It wasn't, don't worry, you'll get it next time. It wasn't, laugh it off. No, it means what it says. you got to learn to love when you're failing. The embracing of that, the discomfort of failing in front of an audience, leads you to penetrate through the fear that blinds you. Now see, I trust Colbert when he says this because he speaks with a wisdom that comes from more than just a few bad shows. Stephen Colbert is the youngest of 11 kids. When he was just 10 years old, his father and the two brothers closest to him in age died in a plane crash. As anyone would be, he was completely traumatized. His life has been an exercise in learning to love the bomb. He says, Boy, did I have a bomb when I was 10. That was quite an explosion. And I learned to love it. That might be why you don't see me as someone angry working out my demons on stage. It's that I love the thing that I most wish had not happened. Wow. Did you catch that? He learned to love the thing he most wishes had not happened. Not to rationalize it, not to learn to be happy about it, but to love it. Throughout the interview, the reporter explores how Colbert's grief influenced his life, how his sadness and anger and uh, gratitude and guilt eventually shaped him into the genuinely grounded and joyful person that he is. It's not that he doesn't have his demons, but they don't control him because he learned to love the bomb. He's made peace with the fact that what he has suffered is what makes him who he is. This is what runs through my mind today, hearing about, uh, hearing Isaiah write about Cyrus, the king of Persia. Cyrus is a foreigner who worships foreign gods, and yet Isaiah names him God's anointed. The word for anointed in Hebrew is Messiah. Cyrus is God's Messiah. Why does Isaiah call this idol-worshipping foreign tyrant a Messiah? Because his conquest of the ancient Near East brought an end to the saddest and most traumatic chapter of Israelite history in ancient times, the Babylonian exile. When Cyrus conquered Babylon, God's people were able to return home. And that's why Isaiah and the Israelites see Cyrus and his armies, this unstoppable juggernaut of conquest and occupation, as a gift from God, an answer to their prayers. Today's text from Isaiah is an exercise in looking for God in 
in unexpected places, places like Persia, and in unexpected people, people like Cyrus. See, we've trained ourselves to think of God as all light and wheel, right? But today, God reminds us that God is present also in darkness and woe. Cyrus' conquest of Babylon would have been anything but pretty. There were battles and massacres, pillaging and destruction, hardly what anyone would call good unless that one were a Persian general. And yet, Isaiah says, this is God's doing. Isaiah invites us to look at all this suffering and death and see God at work. He wants us to look into this misery and to learn to love the body. It's easy for us to see God in joy and beauty, to see God as light, and to see the absence of light and darkness as the absence of God. But we know that darkness also is good, right? Night is when our bodies rest. The darkness of caves or dense forests allows for an entirely different variety of life to thrive. Even blindness sharpens other senses like hearing and touch. This is why even though we might abhor it, when we find ourselves in the throes of pain and misery and ugliness, we may still be able to see God at work, often in ways that we never imagined. Now, I'm not suggesting that God causes evil, but neither is God absent from it. God created this world, and God has entered into it to dwell among us, to face the evils we face, not to hide from them, not to be absent from them. Our image of God's response to evil is the scandalous image of the cross. Jesus didn't shy away from the suffering or pain of life nor did he condemn it. Instead, he accepted it as true. He embraced it even, refusing to withhold even his life. And in that embracing of evil and suffering, he was transformed by it. And he transformed it. In Christ, the greatest act of evil against God becomes God's greatest moment of victory over evil. Jesus' death becomes the defeat of death itself. But he doesn't destroy death. He redeems it. The crucified God takes death into himself and becomes changed, becomes the resurrected God, forever present with us in suffering and death. In Christ, we see the face of God's Messiah, the harbinger, of God's kingdom to come, even in the face of an innocent man being executed on a cross. And so what if, instead of condemning and avoiding the world's suffering, we were to embrace it? I don't mean to seek out suffering or to inflict it on ourselves or others, and I don't mean to worship it, to sacramentalize it into something that where we go to be closer to God. Now I mean to embrace it, like Stephen Colbert, to learn to love the things that we most wish had not and did not happen. To learn to love the bomb. Loving the bomb doesn't mean being glad about it. It doesn't mean telling ourselves that God is doing this to us as part of some grand plan or some mysterious way of making us stronger. Loving the bomb means holding all of that evil and suffering and entering into it, looking for the creative love of God, which is capable of transforming and redeeming it. Now, it's, it's hard for me to talk about this because it's not something I can explain or teach you. It can only be experienced. I know because I've experienced it. Like Mr. Colbert, I had one heck of a bomb when I was a child. 
I lost my mother to cancer at the same age that Colbert lost his father and his brothers. So I've been to that pit. I know its corners and its niches like the back of my hand. I've cried myself to sleep. I've railed and raged against the injustice of a universe that could so callously rob a child of their parent. I have gazed into that darkness, and in it I have seen the face of God. In the midst of that darkness, God has walked with me, forming me to be the person I am now. I realize that without that experience, I would not be me. I'd be someone else. And because I love who I am, but not only that, I also love who God has made me to be, the gifts that God has given me through this, gifts like my stepmother, gifts which have been a blessing to me to help me bless others. Because I love these things, I also love the thing I most wish had not happened. I've learned to love the bomb. Because I love the bomb, I have seen God's face in the darkness. I've been shown how to embrace and hold suffering and be transformed by it. It's a lesson that I still learn every day. But because of that, the terrors of this world no longer have as much power over me as they once did. God has given me hope, which penetrates the fear that would blind me. Children of God, I can't tell you with any certainty where God is in all this mess. I can only tell you where I've seen the Messiah. And I'm telling you that I have seen Jesus in death, in pain, in suffering, in oppression. I have seen that even though our bones are dried up, Jesus brings the promise of new life. The promise of a better world which will rise from the ashes of this one. But only if we face these challenges with love and with hope. It's so easy to be without hope these days. So easy to give into anger and despair and frustration. I wonder if this is our call as Christians in this time, this time of COVID and climate change and disease and unrest. If this is our invitation to stare into the darkness and to look for the face of God. What the world needs most right now might be more Isaiahs, more people to point out the Messiah in the faces that we don't expect. So lift up your eyes, children of God. Look to the hills from where our help comes. But don't forget to turn and look at the darkness as well, to gaze into the face of death. Do you see the face of God there? When you do, be sure to let us know.